Self-Healing by Thought Force, 1907, written by William Walker Atkinson, born 1862, died 1932. Contents, Lesson 1, The Healing Force. Lesson 2, How to Build Up the Organs of Nutrition. Lesson 3, Constipation, Cause and Effect. Lesson 4. The Special Physical Weaknesses of Woman. Lesson 5. Nervousness, the American Disease. Lesson 6. Methods of Self-Healing. Epilogue, a Resume of Principles. Lesson 1. The Healing Force. In taking up the question of self-healing, I should say first that to me all the various methods of healing by the power of the mind are but different forms of applying the same force. I think that the several practitioners of suggestive therapeutics, mental science, Christian science, faith cure, and all the rest are using the same great force, the only difference being in the method of application. Of course, this statement will be at once vigorously disputed by the earnest advocates of this method and that, each of whom will claim his particular way is the only real way, and that all the others are base imitations. Nonsense. Nobody has a monopoly of truth or a corner on knowing. Treatments of every conceivable nature have been given by all people in all ages and all affected cures. It seems to me that I am justified and assuming that all these different methods of cure, including the later day methods, have been simply the use of one great force of nature, and that that great force was latent within the individual treated, and was called into play by the suggestive influence of the various methods and ceremonies employed. Now, do not misunderstand me about this matter of outside influence. I believe that many healers have certain mental qualities developed by practice, which enable them to call into play the healing power within the organism of the patient. But I also believe that most of the real work is done through the brain or brains and great nerve centers of the patient. The healer arouses the recuperative qualities latent within the organism of the patient. This does not conflict with the idea of absent treatment, mental treatment, magnetic treatment, or any other kind of treatment, but merely assumes that instead of the power of the healer working directly upon the diseased part or organ, it reaches the affected part or organ by way of the patient's brain or brains and intelligent nerve centers. Every man or woman has within him, dormant in many cases, a certain recuperative power capable of restoring lost functions and strength to diseased organs. This power may be aroused by the mental power of the healer, the efforts of the patient himself, faith, ceremonies, treatments, remedies. In many cases, this recruitive power is prevented from operating by the influence of fear in the mind of the patient, and the treatment frequently is merely the relieving the patient of his fear thought and replacing it with hope and faith. Practically, a taking off of the brakes 
which the patient has placed on nature's healing processes. Now, the way that nature accomplished this work is by sending increased nerve currents to the affected parts, thus stimulating the circulation and restoring lost functioning powers. Of course, you are not conscious of this change going on, as the work is done by the involuntary mental processes working largely through great nerve centers and a systematic nervous system. You know, of course, that the blood is the life, that nature builds up bodies by means of the blood, which, flowing through the arteries, carries liquid flesh and nourishment to every organ and every part of the body, building, repairing, replenishing, restoring, replacing, nourishing, and which, on its return journey to the heart, carries with it the broken down tissue, waste products of the system, and much other waste. Scraps, discarded material, and garbage. No part of the body, no organ, can be healthy and do its work properly unless it be properly nourished, and the only way it can be nourished is by the blood. Consequently, if the blood supply is deficient or the circulation affected, there is imperfect nourishment and a lack of health, disease. Now, how does nature work in order to keep the circulation normal? By means of the nerve currents sent out from the great dynamo, the brain. And now, note how the law of reciprocity comes in. While the circulation is influenced and directed by the nerve current, nerves carrying this current and the brain which generates and sends out this current are both dependent upon this blood supply for their own nourishment. Note the interdependence of the parts and nature's law of reciprocity and compensation. You will see how a man having one thing must have another and how being deficient in one he will lack the other. It is another example of, to him who hath shall be given, to him who hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. But a man never loses the ability to generate and use his mental reserve force. It may lay dormant and unused, because he knows not how to apply it. It may be kept from working because of the break he puts upon it. But it is there, ready to be used all the time. Now, don't forget that this mental break that man puts on his recuperative force is largely the result of improper thinking. Fear thought, hate, jealousy, are all breaks. Yes, I mean this literally. You all know how the action of the heart is increased or decreased by certain emotions, how the cheek flushes from one emotion and pales with another, thus showing that the circulation is affected by mental states, how the digestion is impaired by unpleasant and sorrowful thoughts, and so on, each showing how the state of the mind will manifest on the physical plane. I believe that all disease is caused by improper living or improper thinking, with the exception of that resulting from accidents, and even that may be made better or worse according to the state of the mind. Of course, I know that some authorities claim that there are no accidents and all is cause and effect, in which the mental state plays an important part. But I cannot take up that matter here, and will assume that an accident is an accident for the time being. 
The main object of these lessons is to tell you that it is possible to call into play the reserve stock of nerve power, nerve impulse, or whatever you may call it. I will call it thought force, and with this explanation, you will understand what I mean when I use that term. I know people who, by a conscious effort of the mind, can change the circulation to any part of their body, making a hand or foot grow hot or cold as they will. They can send thought force to any part of the body and to any organ, thus increasing the circulation to the part or organ and stimulating it accordingly. They can withdraw the surplus blood from the brain and lend it to the extremities and get to sleep in a few minutes. Now, this is what is really done by what is called suggestion or auto-suggestion. I am not speaking of hypnotism, mind you, although the same rule holds good there. And this is practically what is accomplished by all forms of mental treatment, except that usually the increase of nerve force and circulation is along involuntary lines. So far as the patient is concerned, but it is possible for man, with a little practice, to voluntarily stimulate the circulation and nerve current. It is hard for the average man to do this by sheer will, and most of us need a peg upon which to hang our thought force implements. That is, we need to use our hands in order to concentrate our minds so as to get our thought force focused upon the affected parts. This is also true of healers, and explains why they involuntarily fall into the use of their hands in giving treatments. You now understand how important it is to have the blood circulating freely throughout the body, and wish to know how to have it in that way, so I will endeavor to give you a practical plan of equalizing the circulation by thought force. But remember, before this treatment will help you, you must have some you must have stopped hating, envying, fearing, being jealous, and all the rest. You must take off these breaks before the machine will work properly. Assuming that you have done these things, you are ready to begin the first self treatment. First self-treatment for equalizing the circulation. 1. Find a secure, quiet place as far as possible removed from the sights and sounds of the outside world. Lie down, relax every muscle, take the tension off every nerve, make yourself limp all over and act as if your body was as heavy as lead, and was linking down into a soft feather bed because of its own weight. Breathe deeply and slowly, retaining the breath for several moments before expelling it, continuing the deep breathing until a feeling of calm, restful quiet comes over you. 2. Then place your hands on each side of your head, your fingertips meeting over the upper part of the center of the forehead, and the fleshy part of each of your thumbs, lightly pressing upon each temple, your thumbs pointing upward. Close your eyes. Concentrate on the region where your fingertips are, and realize that in so doing, you are generating thought force in your brain, which you purpose sending to all parts of your body, the circulation following the nerve current. After a few minutes concentration, 
you will be conscious of a force being generated for your use. Then pass the hands very slowly down over your, the head, the fingers passing over the eyes, and the outstretched thumbs passing on each side of the neck. When the thumbs touch the collarbone, pause for a moment and re-establish a new center. Then slowly pass the hands down over the shoulders and along the lengths of the body, the tips of the thumbs passing along each of your sides and the fingers as if trying to meet in the center of the front of the body as the hands slip down the body. When the waistline is reached, stop and establish a new center for a few moments. Then, rising into a sitting position on the bed or couch, pass the hands in the same way along the thighs, lower legs, and feet, finishing with the toes. While you are making the slow movements of the hands, realize that the nerve current is slowly passing down through the body and is invigorating and stimulating every part. If any organ is affected, you may let your hands rest there for a moment or two in their downward passage and much relief will be experienced thereby. It should take from one to three minutes from the head to feet, not counting for stops over special organs. Then rest a few minutes and repeat, and so on, for not over seven times. About seven times is a good, thorough treatment, but about three times will give a refreshing treatment. You may treat yourself as often as you like during the day or night, but in this, as in everything else, moderation is well. You will find it advantageous to give yourself a thorough treatment at night when you retire, and a sound night sleep will be the usual result. Do not press hard upon the body in the treatment. You are not manipulating yourself and the movement of the hands is simply intended to make an easy path for the mental current of thought force, a sort of skirmish line thrown out, as it were. You'll be conscious of a decided increase of warmth in the body as the hands move over the several parts, and a positive stimulation will be experienced. In treating yourself, breathe slowly and deeply, letting your hands rest while you inhale and pass slowly down as you slowly exhale. You may not get fuss the, the desired results from the first few treatments, but keep at it and practice will make perfect. When you once get the knack of the thing, you can, in a moment or two, stimulate the circulation to any part of the body and stimulate and strengthen any organ. This treatment for equalizing the circulation is useful in any kind of case. And in fact, every self-treatment should be begun with this equalizing treatment before treating the special organ affected. I will tell you how to treat troubles in all parts of body during this series of lessons, taking up stomach troubles as our first subject in the next lesson. Lesson 2. How to build up the organs of nutrition. I have explained to you how nature builds up the body and keeps it in repair by means of the circulation of the blood. I have explained how the blood carries nourishment to every part, every organ, every cell of the body, building up, repairing, replacing, 
strengthening, healing, and nourishing. I have told you that no part of the body, no organ, can be healthy and able to do its work normally unless it is properly nourished, and that the only way it can be nourished is by means of the blood. I have given you a good working plan or treatment by means of which you can stimulate and equalize the circulation. Thus, gaining great benefits, I have explained the importance of the circulation of the blood and what is the result of allowing the circulation to become impaired. And I will now have something to say about how the nourishment conveyed in the blood is obtained. Although you probably are fully informed regarding the matter, it may be as well to again call your attention to the fact that man obtains the strength from the food he eats, the liquid he drinks, the air he breathes. Without food, he cannot obtain the nourishment required to replace that which is being used up every day. Without water, his organs cannot function properly. A certain amount of fluid being necessary. Without air, he cannot exist. As from it, he obtains the oxygen necessary to oxygenize the blood, thus converting the dark, impure, vinous blood, laden with all the impurities gathered up on its return journey to the heart, into bright, red, pure blood, which will course through the arteries, carrying nourishment and strength to all the parts. I wish to speak of stomach troubles in this lesson. The majority of diseases to which man is subject are due to disorders of the main organs of nutrition these organs are very amenable to mental influences and can be affected for good or bad by mental states. We all know how an appetite can be affected by a disgusting sight or even the recollection of it. Sad news, worry, fright, jealousy, hate, and other mental states or emotions. Anything that interferes with the digestion and assimilation of food causes a reduction in the nourishment obtained by the person and thereby lessens the recuperative building up power given him by nature. Many persons have been in poor health for years owing to a gloomy, fearful mental state causing imperfect digestion and assimilation and consequently an impaired blood supply. Without the normal quantity and quality of blood, no organ of the body receives sufficient nourishment, and consequently no organ functions properly, and the whole system suffers. It is not so much the amount of food one eats as how much he digests and assimilates. Taking this thing into consideration, it will readily be seen that one of the prime requisites Poor health is normal functioning of the main organs of nutrition. I have already pointed out the baneful effects of fear, worry, hate, jealousy, malice, and their ilk upon the digestive organs. It is practically impossible for a man to be a habitual warrior or fretter and remain in good health. The fear thought strikes at the stomach first and through it reaches every part of the body by impairing the quality and quantity of the blood, thus cutting off from every organ, part, and cell its normal nourishment, and in so doing adding to the general breakdown. There is only one way to remedy this trouble, and that is by changing the mental attitude. When the organs of nutrition have run down, they can be built up by sending increased nerve currents or thought force to the affected parts, thus more quickly restoring normal conditions. But unless the patient changes his mental attitude, 
Nothing will avail him much permanently. I will give you directions for a thorough mental treatment of these organs, which will do much to restore normal conditions. But, remember that your recovery depends very materially upon your mental attitude, the quality of your thoughts. So long as you allow the poison of fear thought to remain in your system, you are not out of danger. You will notice that, at the close of this lesson, I advise the use of verbal auto-suggestions or affirmations in connection with the use of the hands. This plan makes the talk easier. I wish to say right here, however, that a man who has practiced along these lines for some time, who has attained a great control of his mental forces, needs neither verbal affirmations, auto-suggestions, or the use of his hands, but can propel a current of thought force direct to the parts needing stimulation. However, as the majority of you have not reached this stage, and as many who have not, as yet, the perseverance to practice until you do reach it, I think it best to make the road as easy as possible for you, and therefore recommend the verbal auto-suggestions and the use of the hands. I've added the verbal auto-suggestions to the movements of the hands in the treatment for equalizing the circulation. Repeat the words, either in a whisper or in your natural voice. The main point is to say to them meaningly and using them as a vehicle for the thought. Self-treatment for stomach troubles. 1. Practice the treatment for equalizing the circulation. As given in the last lesson, repeating the following auto-suggestions. As the hands move slowly down the length of the body, I am equalizing and stimulating the circulation throughout my entire body, thus causing the blood to flow to every part, every organ, and every cell nourishing, building up, and strengthening every part of my body, and carrying away the broken down, discarded material, which it has replaced with new sound material. Every organ in my body is being stimulated and caused to function properly and naturally as intended by the great creative power. And I open up every cell of my body to receive the thought impulse being sent from my mind. Two, then, after resting a few minutes, place the hands over the solar plexus and let them rest there a few moments, lending a current of thought force into that region, saying, I now lend a current of the healing thought force into my main organs of nutrition, thereby strengthening and stimulating them to do their work normally and naturally. Repeat this auto-suggestion several times with meaning and earnestness. You often feel a warm, strengthening current flowing through the parts, soothing and nourishing them. 3. Then pass the hands slowly over the abdomen with a soft, caressing movement of the hands, thus causing the thought force to fairly permeate every part of the organs of nutrition. At the same time, repeat the following auto-suggestions. I am sending a strong current of thought force to my organs of digestion and assimilation and am thus building them up and causing them to function properly. I have the appetite of a healthy person. My stomach is strong, 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 and is able to digest every particle of food that I can place in it. It can digest it, and it will digest every particle of it. I will assimilate every particle of nourishment extracted from my food, 
will extract every particle of strength and nourishment from every ounce of food I have eaten and digested. This nourishment has been converted into rich red blood that is flowing to every part of my body, building up cells, organs, and parts, and is making me over, is making me strong, healthy, and well. I am living as does the healthy person, and I intend to be as the healthy person in every way. I am developing strong digestive powers, and I am gaining health and strength through nature's processes. I am bright, cheerful, and happy. I have abolished fear. My stomach is strong, 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 strong. Strong, 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 and is getting stronger every day I live. It is doing its work well, is doing its work well, is doing its work well, well, well. When you say the repeated words, strong, 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 and well, 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 do so with a positive air, and fairly drive the words into the parts. When you remember that the words are but the outward indication of the inward mental impulse, you will see the philosophy of it. I think it proper to say here that I have known of many cases of dyspepsia, indigestion, and stomach troubles, completely cured by the system of treatment, and I fully believe that 99% of cases of this class of troubles could be cured if the sufferers would only go to work in earnest and put into practice what I am telling them in these articles. I am not teaching theories. I am telling you how to do things. Lesson 3. Constipation, Cause and Effect is it necessary to remove the clothing while administering the self-treatment? Answering this question, I have to say that the removal of the clothing is not absolutely necessary, and excellent results can be obtained by giving the treatment and passing the hands over the body outside of the clothing. However, if you have disrobed for the purpose of retiring, you may as well give the treatment at that time as there seems to be something about the touch of the hand on the bare skin that aids in the directing of the current of thought force to the one uh, affected parts. This being the case, I generally suggest that one administer the self-treatment after retiring at night and before rising in the morning by passing the hands under the sleeping garments at other times during the day. Pass the hands over the ordinary clothing. This lesson will be confined to the treatment of that most common complaint, constipation. There are many theories advanced to account for constipation, but to my mind the most reasonable explanation is that it arises from one or more of the following three causes. 1. Wrong thinking. 2. Insufficient fluids. 3. Neglect of nature's cause. The first cause, wrong thinking, has been somewhat thoroughly explained in previous lessons, and I refer the student to what I have said therein. There is no part of the human organism quicker to feel the effects of wrong thinking then the organs of nutrition, and the first symptom of this abnormal functioning exhibits itself in impaired power of digestion and in constipation. Let the sufferer from constipation and its accompanying ills be sure to take steps to shut off the thought current of fear, worry, hate, anger, etc. The second cause, insufficient fluence, is well known to all who have paid any attention to the subject. Many advocates of mental healing 
resent any reference to exercise, breathing, eating, or drinking, and say that these have nothing to do with the subject of the healing powers of the mind, that they should be ignored altogether as immaterial and on a lower plane than mine. This is very pretty talk, but when we consider that the reason that we have need of mental healing at all is because we have violated some law, mental or physical, and that by mental healing we desire to establish normal conditions, we see that we must conform to the mental or physical law before mental healing or any other kind of healing will do us any good whatsoever. If it is a mental law we are violating, mental healing, simply by establishing proper thoughts, will restore normal conditions. If it is a physical law we are violating, we must adjust our living to that of the normal healthy man, re-establish proper functioning of the organs by means of thought force, follow the rules of right thinking and right living, and we are well. I have no sympathy with those who would insist that we must eat only certain things at certain times in certain quantities. I have been through all that and have turned my back on it. I believe that the healthy man or woman can eat all reasonable foods in reasonable quantities at any reasonable time. But I would not think of saying that man in his present stage of evolution could do without a normal amount of food, and I feel just as certain that he cannot be healthy without drinking a normal amount of fluids. Very few of us drink the normal amount of fluids, and we suffer therefore. And until normal conditions are re-established, we cannot expect to be normal human beings. We have not been able to dispense with the use of bodies so far, and so long as we inhabit bodies, we must care for them properly. Care for them at least nearly as faithfully as we attend to the body of the horse or cow which we may have under our care. When we consider just what an important part in the human economy is played by the fluids, we will see how we have been injuring ourselves by getting away from the natural habits and customs of man, and substituting therefore the abnormal habits made so easy for us by modern civilized life. Physiology teaches us that the normal human being requires at least four pence, two quarts of liquids each day in order to properly supply demands of his organism. If this amount is not supplied, the organism will not secrete sufficient fluids to properly perform the offices of digestion, absorption, and assimilation of food the excretion and elimination of the waste products of the system. The liver will not secrete sufficient bile, the principal purpose of which is to produce a natural movement of the bowels, nor will there be sufficient liquids to wash away the debris through the kidneys and bladder. The result is impaired functioning of one or more organs of the body, and the entire system is affected. Nearly 85% of the human body is water, and if sufficient fluids are not introduced into the system, one becomes more or less like a dried apple. In no way does outraged nature show the result of insufficient fluids quicker than by the symptoms called constipation, and in no way does she show quicker results of a sane habit regarding fluids than by the restoring of normal movements of the bowels. Next to air, water is the thing which nature most strenuously demands, and, not getting, most vigorously shows its displeasure. The third cause of constipation, 
neglect of nature's calls, like every other violation of nature's laws, brings about abnormal results. We are all more or less governed by habits which we have contracted, good or bad. Our modern life takes us away from nature and we suffer in consequence. The subconscious manifestation of the mind, which controls the workings of our vital mechanism, teaches us to do certain necessary things. And when we refuse to listen to its voice, we must pay the penalty. In the hurry and bustle of everyday life, we neglect nature's calls to relieve our system of the waste products. And gradually, a new and abnormal habit manifests itself. Nature ceases to send its calls because we have refused to pay attention to them. And after a bit, she gets disgusted and allows us to run things our own way. And we, having so many things to attend to, frequently neglect the new duty imposed upon us and irregular habits result. When you do not need heed nature's calls, the fluid part of the waste matter is reabsorbed by the system and hardened stools are the results. In addition to this, deferred movements, long continued, result in your establishing a new and injurious habit to the sphincter and a muscle. And instead of a natural tendency to relax at proper times, it acquires a habit of unnatural contraction, which interferes with nature's processes. To many of you, this will possibly seem unpleasant reading. You have been thinking beautiful thoughts, acquiring aesthetic tastes, and refusing so far as possible to even admit the existence of certain of nature's manifestations. You are making a great mistake. Nature and all its manifestations is wonderful and beautiful. To see nothing but impurity and filth in any of God's works indicates a corresponding impurity in your mind. To the pure, all things are pure, and to the man or woman of the broad, natural, cosmic mind, the entire body is pure and beautiful and free from shame. I have known people who had soared so high, question mark, that they could not even think of certain of nature's functions without a shudder, that such people should have the truth forced upon them by means of physical inharmony is not strange. If you are in this class, you need to change your mental attitude. In the following treatment for constipation, you should bear the above remarks in mind. Self-treatment for constipation. Give yourself the general treatment for equalizing the circulation, as stated in previous lessons. Thus producing physical harmony in every part of the body, then pass the heads over the bowels with a firm but soft caressing motion, sending at the same time a current of thought force from the brain to the parts. At the same time, repeat the following auto-suggestions or words conveying the same meaning. I am sending a current of thought force to my bowels thereby strengthening and nourishing them, making them stronger and able to do their work properly as nature intended. They are strong, strong, strong and able to do the work. They can do their work and they will do it. I am taking sufficient fluids each day to supply nature with what she needs for the bowels. I am giving nature that which she needs, and she will do the work properly. I am taking these fluids each day for a purpose, and I am getting the results, and my bowels will move freely, naturally, and easily each day. 
the contracted sphincter muscle will begin to relax, relax, and relax. And again, become natural. I will have a natural movement of the bowels every morning at o'clock naming a convenient hour and i have made an engagement with them at that hour which i will surely keep at o'clock at o'clock at o'clock the result will be attained i am strong and well and nature is working out perfect results i open myself to nature's calls and processes you will find that in a short time you will have established a new habit and that nature will, will again take the reins. You must be sure to keep the engagement with yourself every morning, whether you feel any inclination or not. You must increase your fluids gradually until you drink at least four pence of fluids in 24 hours. This includes fluids of all kinds soup counting as well as water. You will find it a great aid to you if you will take a little water at a time, sipping it slowly instead of drinking large quantities at once. When you sip the water, say to yourself, I'm taking this fluid for the purpose of aiding nature in moving my bowels. In addition to the above, it will be well for you to treat yourself in the region of the sphincter and a muscle, at night after retiring, and in the morning before dressing, passing the hands gently around that part and saying to yourself, as if speaking to the part in question, relax, relax, relax. Say this over and over again, and the thought will take form in action, and the contracted condition will be relieved. This may seem very simple to you, but thousands of people have been cured by this treatment without a drop of medicine, and after they had expended much money on drugs without any permanent result. And, mind you, when you cure yourself by this method, you will stay cured, as long as you follow the system of right living and right thinking advocated in these lessons. Lesson 4. The Special Physical Weaknesses of Woman I think that any woman who is enjoying general health and who is observing all the requirements of a healthy woman will not likely be troubled with special weaknesses. And I believe that if a woman suffering from female weakness will start to work to build up her general health by right thinking and right living, she will find that she will soon get rid of her special weakness. I explained to you in lesson first that the mind builds up the system by sending increased nerve currents to the affected parts, thus stimulating the circulation and restoring lost functioning powers. This work is performed by the subconscious mental powers working principally through the great nerve centers and the sympathetic nervous system. I called your attention to the fact that the blood was the great healing medium, that the mind builds up bodies by means of the blood, which flowing through the arteries carries liquid flesh and nourishment to every organ and every part of the body. Building, repairing, replenishing, restoring, replacing, and nourishing, and on its return passage to the heart, carrying with it the broken down tissue, waste products of the system, and other waste scraps, discarded material, and garbage of the system, that no part of the body, no organ, can be healthy and do its work properly unless it be properly nourished, and the only way it can be nourished is by the blood, that consequently, if the blood supply is deficient or the circulation affected, there is imperfect nourishment and a lack of health, disease, that nature keeps the circulation normal by means of the nerve currents sent out from the great dynamo, 
the brain and that the circulation is influenced and directed by the nerve current, well, the nerves carrying this current and the brain which generates and sends out this current are both dependent upon this blood supply for their own nourishment. Now, in the case of a patient suffering from female troubles, it will usually be found that she has allowed herself to run down in health, has neglected the rules of right thinking or right living, usually both, for right thinking generally causes right living, and is suffering from a number of other troubles outside of the complaint for which she seeks treatment. She did not have these troubles when she was in a good state of general health. And she thinks that the rundown state of the system is due to the special complaint instead of the reverse. Restore the tone of the system, build up the general health, and you'll find that the special trouble has disappeared. Now, how is the general health to be built up? Simply by increasing the nutrition. And how are we to build up the nutrition? simply by increasing the functioning powers of the main organs of nutrition, or rather by restoring to them their lost powers of functioning. And how are we to restore these lost powers of functioning? How are we to give the organs the strength to digest and assimilate the food that we eat? Simply by following the directions I have given you in the previous lessons touching upon the treatment of stomach troubles, Get the main organs of nutrition functioning properly and you will notice a rapid improvement in general health. And when the improved condition of general health is secured, the female complaint will be found to have disappeared or to be rapidly disappearing. When a woman is able to eat as does the healthy woman, drink as does the healthy woman, get the nourishment needed by the healthy woman, live as does the healthy woman, think as does the healthy woman, she need not fear any form of female trouble. She will be the healthy woman in every way. Self-treatment for female troubles. In cases of painful menstruation, I know of no better treatment than a combination of the stomach treatment and the increase of fluids as recommended in a treatment for constipation. In fact, most persons suffering from this trouble also suffer from constipation. The same causes manifest in two different ways. Increase the nutrition and drink the proper amount of fluids, in addition to giving the treatments for equalizing the circulation, and a similar treatment in the affected region, and you will get wonderful results. In cases of displacements, wonderful results may be obtained from the treatment for equalizing the circulation, coupled with a similar local treatment, and at the same time building up the nutrition by treatment directed to the main organs of nutrition, as given in previous lessons. In cases of delayed or irregular menstruation, the same course of treatment produces wonderful results. The patient is usually suffering some other trouble showing imperfect nutrition and elimination. Stimulate the nutrition, increase the fluids in order to enable the organs of elimination to function properly. Give the general and local treatments in order to equalize the circulation and to lend a stimulation nerve current to the affected parts. Irregular menstruation is amenable to auto-suggested treatment by the patient. Let the patient fix her mind upon the day upon which menstruation should occur, beginning about three weeks ahead of time. And each day, think about the time, making that affirmation or auto-suggestion that at the stated time menstruation will occur. Let her keep a calendar in her room and mark off day by day as it passes, keeping the attention fastened upon the stated regular time. This exercise will often bring about the desired result upon the exact date. Although in some obstinate cases, it may be a month or two before the regular habit is established, the treatment has been thoroughly explained in the above article, but that you may fasten it upon your mind, I will sum it up briefly. Give treatment for equalizing the circulation. That's one. Two, 
give stomach treatment in order to stimulate the nutrition. Three, give constipation treatment, not omitting the fluids. Four, give special thought force treatment in the region of the affected parts, following the general directions given for special treatments of our parts of body, giving the proper auto-suggestions or affirmations. This last treatment will stimulate the weakened organs and make them strong and able to function properly. Lesson 5. Nervousness, the American disease. When we look about us, we see scores of people suffering from an abnormal condition of the nervous system. This has been called the American disease because it is apparently more prevalent here than in other lands, although it is found wherever people worry. Worry and fear are at the base of nervousness, and when these two monsters are driven forth, the patient makes rapid recovery. The trouble is that the patient suffering from nervousness is generally in such a weakened condition that it is hard for him to make use of the forces within him, which will enable him to get rid of the sources of his trouble. But it can be done. The first thing to be done by the patient suffering from this complaint is to start to work to cultivate thoughts of hope, confidence, courage, and strength. The only practical and effective way to get rid of negative thoughts is to grow other ones positive ones in their place. The positive thoughts, if kept well watered and stunned, will grow rapidly and will invariably crowd out the foul negative weeds of the mind, which have been causing all the trouble. It is hard work to tear out these negative thoughts, and the best way is to crowd them out by the pressure of the growing positive bright plants of hope and courage. Start to work today to grow these positive plants and see that they receive constant attention. The constant use of the proper auto-suggestions or affirmations will grow within one's mind the strongest and hardiest kind of positive thoughts. And as these positive thoughts grow and wax strong, the negative thoughts will gradually die away. Just as does the light drive away the darkness, so will the strong, vigorous products of the mind crowd out and stifle the miserable mental growths. Fear and worry, and when fear and worry have been crowded out, all the rest of the weeds will die. Hate, anger, jealousy, malice, envy, covetousness will disappear, and the mental garden will blossom in a luxuriance of beauty, joy, and strength. It will be found that the general system has run down by reason of the negative thoughts which have been held. The digestion is affected, the circulation impaired, the brain insufficiently nourished, and the nervous system itself suffering from imperfect nutrition and impaired blood supply. When you get to work in earnest, all these things will begin to improve. The digestion will improve, thus enabling you to get sufficient nourishment. When you get sufficient nourishment, the blood supply will be increased and will improve in quantity and quality. When the blood supply is improved, the brain will be better nourished and will begin able to send greater, stronger thought impulses to the organs and parts. And the bodily health will improve. And when the nervous system is better nourished by means of an improved blood supply, it will do much better work and the old troubles will disappear. Start the machinery going properly. An improvement is noted in all directions. Self-treatment for nervousness, insomnia, etc. In treating yourself for nervousness, first attend to the character of your thoughts and get rid of fear and worry in the manner suggested above. And following the auto-suggestion given later on in this article, then start to work and give yourself general treatment for equalizing the circulation. Following the instructions given in previous articles of this series, there is no better treatment for nervousness than this treatment for equalizing the circulation, for by this treatment every part of the body is nourished and strengthened. 
Their nerves are soothed and quieted, and a general feeling of rest and quiet and happiness is experienced immediately. Many penons have cured themselves of many persons <laughs> have cured themselves of insomnia and sleeplessness by this method of treatment, and others have been able to quiet down extreme nervousness in themselves and others by this treatment alone. The very simplicity of the treatment prevents many from appreciating and realizing its value. It is a result of years of thought and investigation of the subject, and is presented in such a simple form that a mere child could use it. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, so try it for yourself, and then you will know more about it. I know of no better general treatment for relieving a condition of nervousness than my treatment for equalizing the circulation. Of course, one must remove the cause in order to stay cured, but while you are curing yourself, you may as well get as much relief as possible. And each time you gain relief, it gives you the power of storing up strength, whereby you can get rid of the cause. The following is a valuable auto-suggestion or affirmation to use in treating oneself for nervousness. I am holding the thought of peace, harmony, and rest. I am quiet all over, from head to feet, and my nerve force is being distributed evenly and properly all over my body. I feel strong, strong, strong. My nerves are strong and are growing stronger each day. I fear nothing. I worry about nothing. I see my way clear, and I intend to follow it. I see my goal, health, and I'm moving straight forward to it. I feel well, strong, energetic, vigorous, full of life, health, and strength. I feel bright, cheerful, and happy. And I intend to hold to this feeling, bright, cheerful, and happy, strong, and well. Bright, cheerful, and happy, strong, and well. Repeat these words over and over again, as often as possible. The mere reading of them will make you feel much better. You'll be surprised to feel how they affect you at once, immediately. These words will help you from the start and will also assist you in growing the strong, healthy, positive, helpful thoughts that you desire. Try it and see for yourself. Lesson 6. Methods of Self-Healing in the self-treatments, it should be remembered that the patient should start out with the fixed idea of the condition that he or she wishes to bring about. If the stomach is weak, think about a strong stomach. Think about it many times a day as strong, strong, strong. Do not let a thought of a weak stomach enter your mind, but keep on picturing to yourself your stomach as being strong, very strong able to take care of the food you are taking to nourish you, able to digest and assimilate the food, and to convert it into material which will enter the circulation as rich, red, strong, nourishing blood which will be carried to all parts of the system, building up all organs and parts, and making you strong and well all over from head to foot. Think of the stomach as strong, I say, and permit yourself to think of it in no other way. In giving the treatment as directed in the previous lessons, carry this idea of strength in your mind and fairly drive the thoughts, strong, right into the stomach. You'll be able to almost feel it to enter, and a warm, stimulating sensation will be apparent. And as with the stomach, so is it with every other part of the body. You must picture to yourself the conditions you wish to bring about 
and you will find that the organs and parts of the body will gradually develop to the condition pictured in the mind. See your body as you wish it to become, not as it has been. See a perfect condition, not an imperfect one. There is no mystery or magic about this from form of treatment. It is not the mere denial of the trouble that brings about the cure. It is the response of the body to the mental picture formed by you. Thought takes form in action, and the body responds to the thoughts. The mental attitude is reflected in the bodily manifestations. It is very simple when once you have the key. I have endeavored to make these plain simple and practical, and some of you may perhaps think that they are too simple to be good, and would prefer that I give some high flown theories and mystic formulas to be repeated, whereby the disease may be driven away. But I see no need of surrounding the subject with any unnecessary or of attaching unnecessary mystery or of attaching virtue to any particular words. Words avail nothing unless the thought is behind them. Words are only the vehicle of the thought. And the man or woman who expects to derive benefit from the mere parrot-like repetition of certain sentences or affirmations without putting the foot back of them will be sorely disappointed. I do not care whether you use my auto-suggestions or those of someone else, providing you put the thought force back of them. The other persons will do just as well as mine. So if you prefer the other man's style, by all means, use it. If you prefer affirmations which have a high sound and appeal more to the emotional side of your nature, by all means use them. They will do more good than mine if you feel that way. But be sure to put the force of your thought behind the affirmations, or they will fall flat and without effect. It wearies me somewhat when I look about me and see the contentions of the different schools of new thought, healing each claiming that their methods or theories are the only perfect ones. Why, bless your hearts, they are all getting good results, and some are suiting certain persons better than others, but they are all using the same force, and merely calling it into play in a different manner. Every healer has his own favorite way of giving mental treatments, and every part has some way which suits him better. But that is no reason why any of us should assume that we have the whole thing and that the other fellow is necessarily wrong because his methods differ from ours. Let us cease talking, uh, taking this childish position and display a little more breadth. Personally, I preferred a simpler plan. The plan which seems to be the more practical and common sense, and as little weighted down with fury as possible. I have tried this plan, in fact, it has been evolved through trying and experimenting, but that is not saying that it is the only plan worth considering. Try any plan which appeals to you, and the one that you like best will be the one that will allow you to do the most good, whether that plan be mine or to other fellows, but don't attribute your cure to the pet fury of anyone. These cures are worked not by reason of any pet fury, but in spite of the pet fury of the person giving the treatment. The force is available to anyone who wishes to use it, either in the treatment of others, or in the treatment of oneself, and there is no sense in paying out large sums of money to acquire the secret. There is no secret about it. It is one of nature's laws, and is open to anyone who wishes to use it. Just as in any other of nature's laws and forces, no healer or teacher has any monopoly of healing. You can do it as well as anyone else, if you have confidence and perseverance. Of course, practice makes perfect in healing as in anything else. And then again, some persons have more confidence and will take hold of the work from the start, while others have to gain confidence by slow stages. Confidence seems a prerequisite to good healing work. The power and force is there, but a confident frame of mind seems to be necessary to cause it to flow. 
I've seen people who have suddenly realized that they could perform cures who had acquired confidence in themselves all of a sudden, go out and perform wonderful cures from the very start. At the same time, I have seen others develop gradually, but slowly, into healing powers. But in the later case, it is not a growth of power, as they supposed, but a growth of confidence in themselves. The healing force is in direct proportion to the confidence of the operator. Of course, the cure depends upon much the mental attitude of the patient, as the real cure is affected through his own mind, the latent power being awakened and directed by the mind of the healer, and any resistance on the part of the patient, of course, retards the cure. In these lessons, I have given you a good, practical working plan of self-treatment, and the same method may be adopted by you in treating others by simply giving them the same suggestions that have used yourself as auto-suggestions. In treating yourself or others, you will find it of value to treat the diseased organ or part as if it possessed intelligence. Talk to it, think of it as if it understood, and you will be surprised to see how quick that the part will respond. Of course, when you are commanding the part to function properly, you are sending to that part a strong thought wave, both from your own mind and the mind of the patient. And the intensity of your thought will be manifested in like degree in the thought wave reaching the part. It may be, it seem somewhat ridiculous to, to talk to a weak stomach or a rebellious liver or a flighty heart, as if it could understand. But just try it and see how well it works. Talk right up to it and tell it that you have grown tired of its misbehavior and that you're going to take it in hand and make it do better in the future. Tell it just what you want it to do and what you expect it to begin at once. Don't fool about it, but get right down to business and give it its instruction in a calm, masterful manner. You will find that the organ will start it to rebel at the first few words but if you keep right at it, it will gradually come round to your way of thinking and will do as you wish it to. Remember that your mind is positive to the organ and will surely win when it comes to the point. So don't be afraid of the rebellious organ. Then when the organ begins to behave itself, talk to it kindly and encourage it and it will appreciate it. If you have confidence in a corrected organ, it will have confidence in you and will obey your directions. Now. All of this seems very ridiculous to you, doesn't it? Well, just try this method on yourself or on someone else and see the result. Don't try it in a trifling, laughing manner, but get right down to business if you wish results. There are good psychological and physiological reasons back of it, and it is merely calling into operation certain great laws in a plane every day. Every Freeway. I know just what I am talking about, and you can demonstrate the thing for yourself, if you wish. Epilogue, a resume of principles. And now, you who are seeking to be stronger and sounder in body and mind, let us urge upon you the necessity of turning your back upon the old negative thoughts of disease and pain. It can do you no good to go over and over these things in your mind, no good to be continually retailing your aches, pains, and bad feelings to others. It only affects others if they allow it, and does you no good yourself. Stop adding to the words store of disease thought, and start in to add each day a little to the great store of health, Strength and vigor thought, which is growing rapidly since the new thought movement has begun to manifest itself among the people. Don't talk of your aches and pains and miseries <laughs> in your back, side, head, or any other part of you. You are only keeping yourself in your negative condition and attracting to yourself all sorts of injurious influences. It is strange that people cannot see this plainly, although... One has but to look around him to see dozens of instances, any one of which would be enough to clearly demonstrate its correctness. All of us know some people who are continually talking of their troubles and sickness, and we know that these people 
seem to carry an atmosphere of gloom with them, and how depressing is their presence. They enter a room of cheerful people, and in a few minutes, everything has changed, and the air seems full of vibrations of unhealth, pain, sickness, and death. There are some people who are never happy unless they are miserable, and to suddenly take away from them the source of their griefs would be to make them most discontented and unhappy, for they would then have nothing to talk about. Don't be one of this kind. Talk, health, and things will be healthy all around you. Be a dispenser of health vibrations, not a scatterer of mental microbes.